This is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. University of Florida's Tropical Aquaculture Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. Although most common freshwater aquarium fish are farm-raised, many others are collected worldwide by artisanal fishermen. Good habitat and sustainable practices are key to the longevity of these species and the hobby. My guest today, Mike Ticinardi, is an aquarium fish expert, sustainable fisheries advocate, and senior editor for Amazonas and Coral Magazines. He has explored fisheries all over Asia and South America to foster and improve sustainability and has documented his insights in reports, articles, and travelogues. Join us as Mike shares his fishy experiences from the field. We'll be right back after these messages. Put on a perfectly possum pet party. Having an awesome birthday or adoption day celebration for your four-legged friend? Or just want a fun excuse to throw a fun party with your friends from the dog park? Deck out your party with Molly and Bandit Pet Party Accessories, party products designed specifically for pets. There are wearables, including adjustable pet party hats, bow ties, and tutus. The photo prop kits include funny glasses and hats. The party supplies and decorations include coordinating table covers, party banners, cake decorations and treat bowls, cups and bags. Everything you need to create great memories and Instagram-worthy photos. They're available in two colorful themes, Tropical and Fireman. It's a dog's life. Celebrate it with Molly and Bandit Pet Party at mollyandbanditpetparty.com slash petlife. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Aquarium Mania on Pet Life Radio. My guest today is Mike Tuccinardi, aquarium fish expert, sustainable fisheries advocate, travel logger, and senior editor and contributor for Amazonas and Coral Magazines. Hi, Mike. Thanks for joining us today. No problem, Roy. Happy to join you. So... Yeah, especially um, our, our listeners don't know this, but you are actually calling from almost the wilds of, of Peru. And so we're, we're happy you almost. had a good internet connection <laughs> this time. And uh, appreciate sure, yeah, your time. Touch and go. So you've got some fascinating stories. I wanted to start out by asking you some uh, kind of basic personal questions I like to ask all of my guests. How did you first become interested in the aquarium hobby and fish keeping? And, and what was your very first aquarium setup? Sure. Um, yeah, my story is probably not too different from a lot of people in the hobby and industry in that respect. When I was a kid, I was just fascinated by the outdoors. I grew up around Boston and just spent most of the summers like mucking around in swamps, catching tadpoles and, and little fish, anything I could bring home in a jar. And uh, that turned into, I think around like the age of 12 or so, my first marine tank with some uh, cold water marine inverts that I managed to bring home from the from Cape Cod and and surprisingly enough I was fairly successful with the tank and that morphed into a 10 gallon little reef tank back before it was an easy thing to have a nano reef and uh, I really enjoyed it so I started with that I had an interest in reptiles and amphibians too at the time and oddly enough freshwater was kind of the last thing I got into but that was probably around when I was 14 or 15 but freshwater has always it's really been my uh, main focus since then so but yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, I, I had a little pet shop down the road for me growing up and uh, ended up working there for some time. So yeah, you, you were kind of in reverse to what a lot of hobbyists do. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was kind of strange. I, I just was successful at the marine tank and then dove back into freshwater. Um, my first freshwater fish was, I'm pretty sure it was a baby black arowana, which is certainly not a, you know, typical first fish, but uh, I did well with that. I, I love the freshwater fish after that. Got into all kinds of odd, oddball like Amazon or Southeast Asian fish and had a, a number of tanks growing up. I guess that kind of set you up for uh, what we're going to discuss today, which is great. Can you tell us a l- little bit about your background since you were uh, collecting and setting up those first aquariums <laughs> sure. and, and, and a little bit about what you did retail, wholesale and aquarium fish import wise? 
Sure. Yeah. When I was, I think it was around 13 or 14 years old, I started working at that pet store down the road. They basically, I was there so often, they basically were like, hey, you want to come work for us? So that was easy. I was, that was an easy yes. And uh, I was just fascinated by the fish, the reptiles, all the different forms of life they had there. And uh, so I, I was working there as often as I could sneak out and get there. School vacations, nights, weekends, you name it. I worked there all the way through high school and uh, actually put myself pretty much through college. I uh, went to UMass Lowell and just uh, not too far from Boston and worked at the pet store the whole time, full time. And uh, I learned as much as I could about the fish. But one thing that always fascinated me there was figuring out where the fish came from and how they managed to show up at our door every week in bags. You know, that always was something fascinating for me. And a little bit before Google was or that information was so accessible via Google, I, I had a set of the Aquarium Atlas books. I think those three volume black books that were kind of small, but really thick. And they always had, they just had a page, the river the fish came from, and a few little bits of info about them. And every time I found something that I didn't know where it was, I'd flip through those and look, oh, wow, Rio Orinoco, sure, wherever that is. You know, basically, these were all blank spaces on a map at that point for me, but it was just fascinating. After I was just about ready to finish up with school, I was looking at graduation soon and then kind of assumed that the fish thing would always be a hobby of mine, but certainly not a career. But as luck would have it, I kind of was browsing around looking for potential jobs in the industry. I sent an application blind over to Seagrass Farms in Tampa. I was looking to move somewhere a little warmer than Boston. And, you know, within a few months, I had moved down there and started working at Seagrass, which is one of the largest wholesalers of tropical fish in the U.S., and that just really took things to the next level, seeing where the fish came from, working in an enormous warehouse where we had imports coming from around the world every single day. It was really, really an amazing experience. So I was there for a little over three years uh, before kind of deciding that I wanted to travel a little bit more while I was still relatively young and uh, decided to uh, go back to school and get a master's. So how did you end up joining Reef to Rainforest Media, Amazonas and Coral Magazines? I've always really liked writing and I just early on, I did a lot of marketing work for Seagrass and a lot of it was just pretty much writing, writing about interesting fish we brought in, doing newsletter updates. So I started writing actually for Tropical Fish Hobbyist magazine occasionally doing the import report column, which was about every other month. And I, I loved it. I had so much fun with it. It was something that I really enjoyed. I learned a lot of photography, doing it, trying to get pictures of those awesome fish we were getting in. And then from there, you know, Amazonas is an awesome publication. I remember getting the first issue and just being blown away by the quality and the information in it. And I started blogging for them at first, just occasional little updates. And then when I was uh, getting ready to travel for an extended period of time and visit some of the aquarium fisheries, they were really interested in having my stories end up in the uh, in the magazine. So every month, it seemed like every other month when they're running issues or, or doing blog posts, I'd have something in the magazine and it kind of developed from there. You've got some great stories in, um, in the magazine and with your travel logs and blogs. So definitely uh, interested and we'll get into those a little more right now. So um, you went to Asia, I understand, last year. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish and share some stories from various places sure. there? Yeah, the Asia trip was kind of funny. It was something wasn't really planned out as a fish centric trip. I really at the time, my wife and I were just kind of like, you know, we want to see a little bit more of the world before we settle down. And that was the driving force behind going to Asia and kind of spending some time there. But it turned out that so many of the fish come from there. And with all my contacts, different exporters, fish farms, etc., we might as well visit those places. And that really turned into some interesting uh, experiences visiting with fish collectors, visiting you know some of the huge farms where they produce fancy guppies, where they produce African cichlids, all kinds of different fish for the trade. So as the trip went on, more and more of it was focused on fish stuff. And then, you know, I had been working with uh, Scott Dowd at Project Diaba doing work with sustainable aquarium fisheries. And he was really interested in getting a view of different fisheries other than the one they had focused on in, in Brazil's Rio Negro. So I, got, I tried to, wherever I could, visit with fishers, learn a little bit about how fisheries worked in Southeast Asia for wild fish, got to visit with some fishers in Thailand and go out night fishing for needlefish and archer fish, which was a pretty interesting experience considering the language barrier and just the, the whole experience was bizarre and a lot of fun. 
We got to go to, uh, to Vietnam to see a lot of the fishing that goes on there. Sri Lanka, I got to go out and collect fire shrimp and cleaner shrimp with some of the divers out there. Really incredible experience over the course of seven months or so. So tell us a little bit, of, I guess, about some of the specific methods. I'm kind of curious. In, in Thailand, for example, how do they collect the needlefish and the archerfish? Sure, that's um, that was pretty fun, and again, something I had no idea about because of the language barrier. We basically just got in a, into a truck with some fishers at you know, say three in the afternoon, and spent the whole day and night with them, and uh, kind of hung out, observed what they did. But they go to some of the little canals, and interestingly enough, I had thought archer fish and needlefish. There's kind of a an understanding in the hobby that those are brackish water fish for the most part. And we were hundreds of miles from the ocean. So I was kind of intrigued to see what the deal was there. But we went out on some little rivers and creeks just by the rice farms where these guys lived. And they waited till it got real dark. They had a car battery attached to, I think, an old car head headlight. And that was a makeshift lantern. And they'd go out in a little canoe quietly kind of paddle along and they'd visually spot those fish from the surface at night while the fish were kind of sleeping or inactive at least and the light would temporarily stun them so they'd just scoop them up with nets it's really interesting similar to how they collect angelfish and discus in the amazon so what kind of numbers were they able to get in you know in an evening do they get really large numbers we weren't out with them on a particularly good trip because there were no archer fish and just a couple dozen needlefish. But typically, I think 50 and up needlefish per collector is not unusual. Archers, they said about 25, 30, it seemed like. So pretty good for just a couple hours of work at night. And and these guys weren't full-time fish collectors. That's one of the interesting things about the Asian fisheries. Well, not all Asian fisheries, but some of them versus South Americans. These guys just, they had a rice farm and they knew how to collect and where to collect some of the fish that they knew there was demand for. So occasionally when the mood struck them or when somebody called and said they needed some fish, they'd go out and collect. And that was about it. It wasn't a full time livelihood for them. Now, you mentioned a little bit about differences in aquarium fisheries. How can can you explain a little bit more, I guess, about these differences? Sure. Well, one of the things I've been most interested in and is kind of informed from my work with Project Piaba, where they have a lot of data on one specific fishery in the Rio Negro in Brazil about how that fishery has provided livelihoods for people that are generally sustainable and has actually had a positive impact on environmental preservation there. Because these these areas where there's very limited options for rural people to have livelihoods, if they can collect aquarium fish and uh, get cash incomes, it kind of prevents them from more destructive livelihoods like, say, clear-cutting huge swaths of rainforest for agriculture or gold mining, illegal logging, that sort of thing. So I was really interested to see if that was the case in other places or what factors have to come together to make an aquarium fishery be a net positive for an area and an environmentally beneficial thing. And that does seem to vary everywhere. I think there's, uh, in Asia, a lot of fishers, they're not full-time and they're not necessarily community-based fisheries because most of Southeast Asia, the the predominant form of aquarium fish trade there is aquaculture fish. It's fish farms. They're not catching and shipping out a ton of wild fish there. But in South America, the opposite is true. There's a lot of wild fish collection, not a lot of production. And a lot of the fish collection here is community-based. So sustainability is obviously a real important idea and, of course, also a buzzword um, that can be really difficult sure. to, to assess in you know, specific situations. Can you explain some of the challenges with determining whether a fishery is sustainable? Definitely. That is, it's a huge challenge. And uh, it is a, a phrase that's overused today and definitely become a bit of a buzzword. So I'm hesitant to use it. I almost want to use it with quotation marks around it sometimes because sustainability can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. The way I look at it is, you know, is this activity, particularly aquarium fish collection, is it having a significant negative impact on the environment or on the target species? What is the impact on the target species year to year? Uh, are they declining? Are populations declining, or are there other effects of the fishery that are causing issues in the environment? But that's the sort of stuff that takes a lot of research and a lot of time to really determine. Mostly, what I'm looking for: is what are the common threads between that may make aquarium fisheries tend to be sustainable? What is it that drives that and how can we kind of determine what those are and possibly promote them in other fisheries around the world? So what I'm doing is really, really basic stuff. I'm not embedded in a fishery for a year over year looking at, you know, doing typical fisheries work, which is uh, stock assessments 
and that sort of thing. I don't have time for that. And there's right now there's no funding or really anybody doing that in aquarium fisheries, at least with freshwater fish. But what I'm doing is visiting, gathering as, as much data as I can quickly about where the fishers are active, how many fishers there are. Is it a community based or is it just a few individuals working the fishery? And my hope is that, you know, others with an interest in this may be able to research further and we can have a better understanding overall of these fisheries. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a huge amount of work that would need to be done. Are there any uh, specific fish in Asia that you you think people are concerned about or, or is it still not enough information to really know? I mean, there are certain fish there that I was concerned about in Thailand and Cambodia and Laos. And the collectors, from what I understand, are having to go further and further out to collect, which is usually a bad sign uh, in terms of populations. But that's an interesting fish, too, because 90, 95 percent of the collection of that fish is going to local markets. It's not for export necessarily. The U.S., we get a lot of Indonesian datanoids and uh, the coastal or silver datanoids which are widespread throughout Asia. The, uh, the expensive varieties and the really sought after varieties are mostly going to China, Hong Kong, Japan, even local markets in Thailand and Cambodia. But that was one I remember that stood out that kind of seemed like something to be concerned about. Now, many people think of fish collection as really only a negative practice. The Association of Zoos and Aquaria turned that idea 180 degrees. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and what the AZA is? Definitely. Yeah, that's been a really interesting process. And I think kind of reflects the current change in thinking among conservationists where before it was looked at any activity that was exploiting a natural resource, especially like timber or, you know, whether it was aquarium fish, whether it was any kind of forestry product was looked at as a negative. And understandably, in a simple sense, if you're taking something out of the environment, yeah, that's going to be a negative. However, the understanding of conservation now is a little bit more complex. And we realize that you have to take into account not just the environment as an abstract, but the people who live there. So sustainable livelihoods has become a real focus. And the AZA has, which is the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in the U.S., that's kind of the trade organization for major zoos and public aquariums. It's also an accrediting body. So it uh, credits those organizations, those institutions. And this year at their conference, the Freshwater Fish Tesson Advisory Group, FFTAG, that's a group of people within the AZA who work on freshwater fish. They had a booth that was specifically promoting wild fish collection as a potential protector of habitat, critical habitat for animals like elephants, animals like orangutans, who are really, really declining due to habitat destruction. Well, let's take a little break. We'll take a short break and we'll continue our discussion with Mike Ticinardi, senior editor and contributor for Amazonas and Coral Magazines, after these messages from our sponsors. It's designerpetsweaters.com. Hand-knitted designer sweaters for your precious pup or cool cat. Beautiful couture patterns for your pets, including custom-knitted formal wear, casual wear, yachting, and even sports-themed. Many designer pet sweaters include feathered tammy hats, top hats, and a lot of sparkle. Each sweater includes leg loops, front paw sleeves, and leash opening. Visit designerpetsweaters.com to order your four-legged fashions today. Your pets will stay warm for the winter and be runway ready. Large or small, we fit them all. Designerpetsweaters.com Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets. On Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com <laughs> back and continuing our conversation with my guest, Mike Ticinardi, senior editor and contributor for Amazonas and Coral Magazines. So Mike, you were telling us a little bit about some of the various concerns of, with sustainability, and you also had mentioned um, Scott and Project Piaba. Can you tell us a little bit more about Project Piaba and what's going on now? We had the opportunity to interview Scott uh, probably a year or two ago, but I know things have changed. So can you tell us a little bit about your work with Project Piaba? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah, I've been I've been working with them for, I want to say, almost three years now. And a lot has changed in that time. Project Piava is going back, you know, almost 20, 25 years now. But in recent years, it's come together as a focus group towards advocacy and promotion and improvement of the fishery on Brazil's Rio Negro. And uh, I got involved, as did some industry folks a couple years ago, 
when Scott was looking to get together a board of advisors and he tapped a bunch of people throughout the, the industry, throughout the AZA, the zoo and aquarium community, and some people from conservation got us all basically talking together in a really interesting series of dialogues about how we can move forward as as one and help promote conservation from all our different positions. So now with Project Piava, we're looking to promote the fishery basically because the aquarium fishery on the Brazil's Rio Negro, one of the best studied in the world and one of the most known sustainable aquarium fisheries in the world is right now under severe threat of, of basically failing or collapsing because cardinal tetras and rummy nose tetras, some of the flagship species from that fishery have been produced in aquaculture and are widely available from other areas. So it's... um. Right now, we're looking to kind of stem the flow and the stem the attrition of, of fishers and make sure that that fishery stays viable until some point where we can say, OK, it's secure, it's viable, and then uh, we can work from there. But yeah, right now, Seagrass has been doing a ton of work with Project Piava over the years. They're shifting some of their sourcing over to Rio Negro fish. They're bringing fish in specifically from the Rio Negro because they're known and it's a known sustainable source of wild fish, which is great and at the moment rather rare in the trade. So it's something you can you can buy a fish from that's wild collected from the Rio Negro and kind of know that, OK, this is actually helping sustain livelihoods in the forest that protect forests and protect riverine habitats of these fish. And we've got some retail partners lined up who are really excited to start selling these fish. That's always been a big challenge is Project Piava had this marketing campaign almost or a great message that was like wild Rio Negro fish and you can help preserve habitat. But it was always a real challenge to figure out, OK, as a hobbyist, realistically, where can I get these fish? So Seagrest and some industry partners in retail and Project Piava are all coming together to make that a little bit easier for people. So this is, I guess, kind of like a cool country of origin sort of labeling. Are they going to specifically say where fish are coming from in stores then, or how is that going to work? Yeah, ideally, it'll be something where we get a little bit more transparency and and retailers who are partnered up and are interested in doing this will have a specific label that says, okay, this Rummy Nose Tetro or this Epistogramma is sourced from the wild Rio Negro. We're still working out the details. I think it won't be really entirely rolled out until... uh, early next year but it's an exciting thing certainly and um to be for as a hobbyist to be able to get that to make that choice make that informed decision to buy a fish that you know is doing good in its source country that's really cool i don't think there's many examples of that in the aquarium trade so i guess that kind of leads to a discussion about aquaculture and wild collection what's the uh i guess the best way to balance aquaculture and wild collection to enhance quote unquote sustainability Sure. Yeah, it's tough because there's no clear answer in any case whether aquaculture is always better or wild collection is always better. Every single fish, it varies, really. And um, aquaculture fish are awesome for a lot of species that are you know, fairly rare in the wild or just remote to the point of not be, wild collection not being a feasible option. Without aquaculture fish, we wouldn't have an extraordinary number of fish that we can go buy at any local pet store now. So that's, uh, I don't want to make it sound like aquaculture is a bad thing, far from it. But what's becoming important now is kind of looking at each individual case and saying, okay, what's my best sourcing option? And some, I think some of the leaders in the, uh, in the aquarium industry and fish wholesale are starting to do that, which is awesome. They're starting to make thoughtful purchasing decisions about what's going to give the best outcome for the environment. And I think hobbyists are interested in doing that, but don't always have access to the information. So one of the most important things is just kind of educating. One of the things I try and do with my articles and my writing, just in general with my work at Piava, is kind of get hobbyists thinking, where do my fish come from? And if I have a choice, what's my best choice in terms of having a positive impact or at least minimizing negative impact? That's kind of an important thing in general in the world today. So to that point, I guess, you kind of addressing it. What can hobbyists do? And is basically there going to be more information that they need to wait until next year? Or what's the best way for them to approach those questions in terms of what to buy? Sure. I mean, just as anyone would tell a new hobbyist or uh, even an experienced hobbyist thinking about a new species of fish, do your research. That's really important. And not just about care information. I guess that's the important thing is don't just research, okay, what size tank do I need? What's the best pH and and hardness to keep this fish at? How am I going to get it to breed? Maybe take it a step further and think, okay, where is the best option to get this fish from? Who am I going to buy it from that I know 
or I may be able to find out, is offering a sustainable option. Is aquaculture better or is wild better? There's certainly cases where aquaculture fish are the more sustainable option. And then there's other cases where wild fish may be the better option. I think in the case of many, if not most fish collected from the Rio Negro area, wild fish are probably the better option right now. And you know, that may change as more research comes out. Again, you need to really think about the scale of it and look at a lot of individual fish species. But for right now, I think we can fairly safely say, based on the body of research that's been done in the Rio Negro, that most of the fish there are not only a sustainable option, as in you're not going to be depleting the stocks of fish uh, over time, but it's helping preserve the environment there and helping support sustainable livelihoods in a place that really needs it. And um, yeah, and I guess that's always going to be kind of a complicated sort of deal just because of... Um, of course. I'm not knowing, yeah. So, okay. Well, with uh, with the access to information that hobbyists have now compared to even five years ago, it's it's really crazy. It's come a long way. The Internet's been a great equalizer in that respect. And I think people are starting to think more about the global scale of things as opposed to just the local, which pet store should I buy from? No, think, think about where the fish came from to begin with. And um, that it, access to information is becoming easier. Um, there's more information than ever out there about where the fish are sourced. A lot of the better retailers in the U.S. and um, online sellers and wholesalers, too, they're including sourcing information on the fish. So you're not just buying a, uh, a green discus anymore. You're buying a green Rio Javari discus or you're buying a uh, green Tefe discus and it tells you what river system it's collected from. That's that's pretty cool. And I think that's where the, a lot of the industry is heading and a lot of the hobby right now. So that little geographic indicator that little bit that comes along with the fish adds value to it and it, it allows a hobbyist to make an informed decision about whether they want to buy that fish from that area so moving on now to this year you have a new mission and uh this time it's south america versus asia from last year can you give us a little bit of info on what your goals are for your current visit to the amazon Sure. Yeah, this trip has been a lot more focused, which is great. We've kind of planned specifically around Amazon Basin collection points, some of the hubs where the trade exists here. So we started out in Colombia in Bogota about a little over a month ago and got a chance to go out and visit some of the fisheries there. Went to Leticia, where a lot of the Amazon fish are collected in Colombia. And a lot of it's just been kind of Again, same as I was doing in Asia, just asking questions. Okay, where are the fish coming from? Because when you're in the trade and if you're just kind of perusing some of the information out there, you might think a lot of aquarium fish come from Bogota, but that's far from it. There's no tropical fish up there. It's a cool city in the mountains. So the fish are all coming from different areas of the country and different river systems and trying to figure out, okay, which river systems are play an important role in the trade, how many fishers are active, that just real basic ground level information like that has been the stuff I've been compiling. And uh, hopefully this will all end up in a publication for the um, IUCN, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. They have a new home aquarium fish subgroup, and and I'm hoping that most of this information will end up in one of their publications, kind of a, a big overview of the aquarium trade in the world, of wild capture fisheries. Can you tell us a little bit more about this home aquarium fish subgroup? What What is their, I guess, ultimate goal or what is the group trying to achieve? Sure. It's a really new group. It's a subgroup of the Freshwater Fish Specialist Group of the IUCN. And it was just kind of conceived and developed last year it was as a as a reflection of the fact that the home aquarium fish trade is a, plays an important role in freshwater fish ecosystems worldwide. And so what we're doing is looking to build on some of the groundwork laid by Project Piaba and Scott Dowd about aquarium fisheries and looking to, okay, analyze where there are fisheries in the world, basically just compile that information, which I don't think has really ever been done comprehensively before, figure out the scope and scale of those fisheries and look for some of the common threads that might indicate sustainable fisheries are possible there. They're currently, the fishery may currently be sustainable. And so we're looking for good examples to promote, basically. And then ideally, as more research gets done and more people start working at the fishery level, we can start to take those lessons from fisheries where the sustainable work is being done and apply them to other fisheries that may be a little less sustainable or maybe in need of some improvements. For the listeners that aren't aware, the IUCN is the International Union for Conservation of Nature, right? 
Right, right. That's a huge multinational conservation group, really. They do a lot of different work, but they're mainly famous for the IUCN Red List. That's one of the major publications, which it kind of assesses the threatened status of all different species all over the world. So the IUCN Red List is a huge comprehensive list of, of animals and plants and fish, everything, and it'll tell you whether they're threatened, critically endangered, vulnerable, that sort of thing. I had the opportunity to go to Colombia and a couple other areas around uh, South America that obviously speaking the language helps. And I guess your Spanish is pretty good. How do you gain people's trust? And, you know, just kind of the basic, you know, I guess questions like how are you able to get the information, you know, going to a different country? It's it's, it's not easy. Um, The freshwater fish trade is tough to get down past, say, the export level. It helps because I have a trade background. I've worked with a lot of these exporters. They know me. They know my name, at least. So there's certainly a level of trust there. And um, that really helps getting, you know, just getting information. But going beyond the level of the exporter and actually getting down to where the fish are is really challenging. I went, went to Leticia kind of blind and I knew there was a guy there. I knew his name. But that was it, who worked and shipped out fish to the exporters in Bogota. And so I spent a good, the better part of a day with a local guide just kind of asking around if anybody knew him. And I got his phone number. I couldn't get a hold of him via phone. We ended up just walking up to his house late afternoon and knocking on the door. And <laughs> This guy had never met me before. But, you know, that sort of thing is what it takes sometimes to get a little bit past the, the level of just looking at exporters and seeing, OK, where are the fish collected? How many hands do they pass through before they get to a home aquarium that's always fascinating too so yeah it's it's challenging for sure and a lot of it is misses a lot of times i'm right there but can't quite get to the bottom of what i'm trying to find out but uh you gotta just be persistent and keep working so i guess to that get a little bit more i guess detail and maybe a little bit more uh color can you tell us a little bit about leticia and maybe some of the habitat and number sure. of fishermen involved that sort of thing yeah, Leticia is a fascinating place. It's right on the border of Peru and Brazil. So it's called Tres Fronteras, or three borders. And uh, it's kind of a lawless or free for all kind of area. There's no border checkpoints. So you can freely walk between all three countries without passports, without any kind of documentation. It's interesting, but there's a lot of aquarium fish there because it's right on the actual Amazon River itself. And it's a beautiful, beautiful area. There's tons and tons of different black water streams, white water streams. There's large, large areas that right now the Amazon's fairly low there. So we're able to go fishing on some of the sandy beaches and find some really interesting species. But primarily that fishery is important for autosynclus, which are a really common mini algae eater for freshwater aquariums, and pygmy quarries. That's the other species that comes out of there that's big. And I mean, tens of thousands are collected down there in that region every single year. And that's kind of the bulk of the fishery. But there's a lot of other fish that come out of there, like epistogrammas, angelfish, occasionally freshwater puffers, freshwater leaf fish. So it's a very interesting area. How many fishermen are fishing that that specific area? Do you have any uh, idea in numbers? I'd have to check my notes for exact, but I want to say it's around 80 to 100 families in that area. So it's not, that's pretty typical for a decent sized fishery. They're not huge uh, in most cases. A lot of these fisheries, it's, it's a fairly small number of people and they're fairly spread out. So I think it was about 80 to 100 was what I came up with after a couple different interviews, talking to people who had worked in the fish trade there, talking to people who currently buy from fishermen there. Uh, I think that was the figure. So. And you said unlike in Asia, or at least in in what you would see in Asia, these guys are pretty much getting most of their money and and, uh, income from fishing, correct? Yeah, it seems to be more of a trade or an occupation here than it did in parts of Asia, at least Southeast Asia, I should should say. India is kind of an exception. There's a lot of community-based fishing there, too. But here, it seems like it's full-time, and they're fishermen. You know, of course, they'll fish for food, fish for sustenance, too, but they're not going out every day and doing a different job. It's, It's pretty much aquarium fish collection, which is interesting because, especially here, where it's been going on for a couple generations now, that I think does tend to lead to some level of resource stewardship and some level of long-term thinking where you're thinking, okay, I want to be able to collect these fish the next 10 seasons and I want maybe my kids to be able to collect these fish and make an income off it after, you know, so that there tends to be a little bit more care because of that. If you're just collecting part-time and it's not really your main gig, that it doesn't lead to that sort of stewardship of the resource. 
And uh, I, I don't know if this is too long a question, but for the Auto Sync list, for example, can you, you know, maybe briefly tell us like when it's first collected and you know, like how long and maybe just sure. some of the steps until it gets into the to the wholesaler in the US. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a fascinating story. That's actually an upcoming blog post I've got in the work. So I've got some of the notes here. But basically, they're collected in um, fairly dark water. I wouldn't say black water, but not like turbid white water like the Amazon is. The little tributaries around there and some of the lakes, um, they like rocky areas. They like rapids, fairly shallow areas. And they're netted out by the thousands over there. And they're, they're really, they are quite abundant. And the collectors collect them. They put them in uh, little plastic or styrofoam containers. Usually it's only a one day to two day trip back to Leticia where they'll sell them to a a middleman or a buyer and the buyer will hold on to the fish by the thousands. And some of them just have really basic setups with just a couple of uh, like almost little pools full of fish, no water movement, no filtration, pretty simple. But some of them have fairly elaborate systems of uh, either like ponds or spring fed ponds that are actually recirculating. They'll end up there for a while where they have plentiful natural food items. They got lots of algae to graze on. They're pretty happy. They pull them out. They have to hand count thousands of them and ship them by plane to Bogota, which is about a 400 mile flight away. In Bogota, they'll end up either getting shipped out immediately or some of the better exporters actually bring them outside the city, another two and a half, three hour drive to their facilities in uh, Via Vicencio, which is kind of a hub for tropical fish collection as well. And a lot of the exporters have facilities there with ponds and tanks for more long term holding. And the fish may end up there for several months being held on to until they're ready to ship out to the U.S. or to Japan, to Europe. It's quite a process for a little fish. Yeah, that definitely sounds pretty complicated, but very, very fascinating. You're collecting a lot of information, obviously. What are you hoping to ultimately do with all this info? Uh, Like I said, the ICN group is kind of hoping to publish a uh, white paper or just a a broad level overview of the home aquarium fish trade in freshwater fisheries. And so I'm hoping to contribute a lot and uh, be able to put this information to use And again, it's really basic information. I'm not here working like full time, like a a full time master student on a thesis or a Ph.D. student would where they'd really focus and hone in on one issue. This is kind of high level stuff of just interviews, collecting data. I've got a map that I'm making notes on, but ideally that'll lead to more access to information for people who might be interested in this sort of thing. So not only just potentially more research being done, but for hobbyists, too, I'd like to be able to publish this in a format that's a little you know, readable and accessible. So I think I'll, I'll be publishing chunks and bits of pieces of my uh, information in Amazonas magazine in the coming months and kind of elucidate some of the journeys that the fish make before they get to a home aquarium or before they even leave their country of origin. It's, it's really fascinating stuff. Yeah, I agree completely. And and hopefully, um, you know, along with the, the great stories you tell and, and uh, information that you're getting, uh, we'll revive interest and fan the flames for the aquarium hobby, because I think there's so much kind of ecology and biology and just general Absolutely. science, you know, involved. So well, the human aspect of it's really amazing, too. And that's one thing I, I really I try to focus on in um, my writing and, and in just you know, what I do is it's not just about the fish. The fish are obviously why we're both doing this, but um, the human aspect can't be overlooked. Like the fishers who really rely on this as their livelihoods and some of the people I've met who have been fishing for 30 years and they're the second or third generation doing it, you know, they really have pride in what they do. And and there's just a, a real connection between them and the fish and the fishery. So those stories are fascinating. And uh, the more I think we can bring that to people's attention, the more I think hobbyists can realize, oh, wow, there's a human who actually thousands of miles away from me collected this fish and got it to me. That's kind of a cool thing. And I think might add some interest to the hobby, too. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. I want to thank you very much, Mike, for, uh, no for problem, all your Roy. time. To do it. And also to our producer, Mark Winter, for making this show possible. I think you kind of gave a pretty good summary, but did you have any other final words of wisdom that you'd like to share with us? No, I think, I mean, that pretty much summed it up. Just a reminder that, you know, there's a lot that goes into those little purchasing decisions you make. And I think that's true, whether as much in fish as it is with the food we buy or, or the products we buy, too, is thinking about where they come from, kind of making a thoughtful choice when you're purchasing something. That goes a long way and that can really help uh, improve the world we live in. 
Thanks for that. And thanks again for joining us. No problem. Please be sure to follow Mike Tuccinardi's Aquarium Fish Travel Adventures in the Amazon through Amazonas Magazine and blogs on Reef to Rainforest Media. Additional information and web links will be on Mike's Aquarium Mania episode page at PetLifeRadio.com. I encourage all of you to visit my Aquarium Mania blog on Pet Life Radio. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for a show, email me at drroy at petliferadio.com. That's D-R-R-O-Y at petliferadio.com. Until next time, please visit your local aquarium stores, keep your tanks clean and your fish healthy, and think sustainability when you purchase fish. Let's Talk Pets, every week on demand, only on petliferadio.com.